JFK's complicity in establishing the American police state through disarmament. Published on April 30th, 2015, uh, libertyunderattack.com. Uh, read by the author, Shane Radliff. In the times we live in today, it seems that there are endless amounts of grievances that have been afflicted upon the American people. And every day that list continues to grow and grow. With this government we currently have in place, it will continue until the climax otherwise known as complete enslavement. It is an easy observation to see these tyrannical powers sucking away every ounce of freedom that we have left. Government is a leech that will not stop until there is no blood left. The American people are nearly tapped dry. Most are unaware that this isn't a new occurrence. Then start with Obama and it won't stop with him. For one clear-cut example in the history of abuse, I recommend you check out Kyle Reardon's article, A History of Dragnet Wiretapping. For other examples, I recommend you continue reading. There exists a sort of hero worship within the alternative media of an assassinated president known as John F. Kennedy. Now, I will admit, I, I used to somewhat fall into that category, but as with most of my other previous, previously held beliefs, further research has led me to the real JFK, the one not discussed by most of the alternative media. There's been a, a meme floating around on Facebook, uh, propagated by big alternative media pages, that says something along the lines of four out of five of these presidents prefer world government. And JFK is the only one, unchecked, that supposedly didn't. I intend to squash that myth with his own words and with the legislation he foisted on us, and even advocated for in front of the United Nations. A good place to begin is the current state of America. Uh, particularly in terms of gun control. We've seen over the years how the mainstream media blow these school shootings out of proportion. A dozen or so dead school children seems to be the major reason to disarm Americans. Now let me ask you one question though. What about the 500,000 children that were killed by Western sanctions in Iraq? Shouldn't that be reason enough to disarm this genocidal government and its tracks? I'm sure you can sense my sarcasm here, uh, yet this is a deadly, serious matter. Disarmament even more. Once the people are disarmed and defenseless, the democide starts. Democide is by definition, death by government, not including casualties of war. We've seen it too many times over history. Example, examples, feudal Russia, possibly 1,066,000 murdered. Mexico, 1900 and 1920. 1.4 million. North Korea, uh, creation to present day, some 1.6 uh, million murdered. Yugoslavia, 1944 to 1987, 1,072,000 murdered. Pakistan, 1969 to 1971, well, ap approximately 1.5 million murdered. Poland, 1945 to 1950, approximately 1 1.6 million murdered. Vietnam, 1945 to 1987, nearly 1.7 million murdered. Turkey, 1900 to 1923, nearly 1 1.9 million murdered. Cambodia, 1970 to 1980, over 2 million murdered. Japan, 1937 to 1945, approximately 6 million murdered. Chinese nationalists, 1927 to 1949, 10.2 million murdered. German National Socialists, 1939 to 1945, approximately 21 million murdered. Chinese Communists, from 1949 to 1987, 35,236,000 murdered. Russian Communists, 1917 to 1987, 61,911,000 murdered. The first major step towards democide in all of these examples is universal disarmament of the people. That is one objective of the Global Disarmament Bill, signed by John F. Kennedy. Only his proposition is worldwide. Democide on a much larger scale by a world government. Maybe then, statists can achieve their goal that they have literally set in stone. Of course, I'm referring to the Georgia Guidestones, where the declared goal is to maintain humanity at 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. Part 1. Global disarmament is the plan. PL 87-297 is proof. The first place to start is in 1957 when the U.S. Disarmament Agency was created and Congress adopted the disarmament plan. The U.S. Disarmament Agency was a, was a part of the State Department. 
Just a few short years later, on September 26, 1961, Public Law 87-297, otherwise known as H.R. 9118, was signed into existence by President John F. Kennedy. This bill established the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, which replaced the U.S. Disarmament Agency. The updated version is known as Public Law 101-216, signed on December 11, 1989. We'll focus on JFK's treason. The title of PL 87-297 States, Freedom from War, the United States Program for General and Complete Disarmaments in a Peaceful World. It is a Department of State publication, 7277, and a number five in the disarmament series, and it has been added to and updated 18 times, and none of its provisions have been deleted. Let me say this before I go any further. If JFK was strictly advocating for peace and the reduction in the number of nuclear weapons, then that would be an admirable act. The major issue with this bill is that the government entity at the head is the United Nations. The introduction begins by saying, quote, First, there must be immediate disarmament action. Second, all disarmament obligations must be subject, subject to effective international controls. Third, adequate peacekeeping machinery must be established, the United Nations. Nations are unlikely to shed their means of a self-protection in the absence of alternative ways to safeguard their legitimate interests. This can only be achieved through the progressive strengthening of international institutions under the United Nations and by creating a United Nations Peace Force to enforce the peace as the disarmament process proceeds. The first question that arises is, can peace actually be enforced? The word enforce implies that there has to be some entity using force or coercion to achieve the goal, whereas peace is, well, peaceful. And any time there is the threat of force, it is not peaceful. In the Disarmament Goal and Objectives section, it says, quote, In order to make possible the achievement of that goal, the, pro the program sets forth the following specific objectives towards which nations should direct their efforts the disbanding of all national armed forces, and the prohibition of their reestablishment in any form whatsoever other than those required to preserve internal order and for contributions to a United Nations Peace Force, the elimination from national arsenals of all armaments. The document continues on stating, quote, the institution of effective means for the enforcement of international agreements and for the maintenance of peace in, according with, in, in accordance with the principles of the United Nations. End quote. As it is easy to tell, uh, this bill places the United Nations at the head of the disarmament process and is also in conjunction with the principles of the United Nations. I think it's blatantly obvious that any person who would sign this piece of legislation would have to be in favor of world governments. If they weren't, why would they turn over control of disarmament to an international agency? The next important aspect of this is the section titled Governing Principles. It discusses ways in which to ensure security and trust among nations so that they can safely and comfortably disarm, knowing that the other nation will as well. This section states that, quote, as states relinquish their arms, the United Nations must be progressively strengthened in order to improve its capacity to assure international security and the peaceful settlement of disputes, end quote. The first aspect uh, mentioned is that, quote, disarmament must proceed as rapidly as possible. Next, it, is, it discusses inspection and verification techniques to be used. Quote, inspection and verification must establish both that nations carry out scheduled limitations or reductions and that they do not retain armed forces and armaments in excess of those permitted at any stage of the disarmament process. End quote. This will take us into part two of this article, but before we move forward, uh, let's first take a look at one other crucial piece of this legislation. Uh, this will be an excerpt from the second stage. It says, the dismantling or the conversion to peaceful uses of certain military bases and facilities wherever located. 
Uh, now this will be this will also be important when we move on to part two of this article, but let's summarize. It only makes sense when looking at the rest of the bill that military bases must be closed or converted to peaceful uses. Now there are two things worth mentioning, one from the 1990s and one from 2015. On April 21st, 1993, in the San Jose Mercury News, it discusses the inauguration of the Gorbachev Foundation in the USA, which uh, is headquartered in San Francisco. Mikhail Gorbachev was the last president of the Soviet Union. Uh, later on in that article, it states, quote, Gorbachev announced that the foundation is creating a national task force on U.S. military base closings. The group will call for a national conference of the 36 U.S. communities that the base closings affect, end quote. <clears throat> so not only are military bases being closed down to lift up the United Nations Peace Force, but it's being done in America by a former Russian president. Next, uh, let's fast forward to an article by Rare, posted on April 22nd, 2015, exactly 22 years and one day after the previous article, with the headline, quote, the Pentagon wants to close military bases, Congress says no. The article continues to say, quote, the Pentagon has argued for years that multiple bases inside the United States are completely unnecessary, but the concern about losing a lucrative base in their own district has kept much of Congress averse to any talk of closures. The last such closures, closures were in 2005, end quote. Note that base closings are being discussed in the mainstream media. This again leads us into part two, uh, but let's first take a look at John F. Kennedy's own words when he addressed the United Nations General Assembly on September 25th, 1961, to advocate for this bill to be implemented. If you click here, you can watch the video and hear him say these words for himself, or you can read the full transcript. Now, for those JFK worshippers, I recommend you watch the video. Kennedy starts by saying, quote, Dag Hammarskjöld is dead, but the United Nations lives. End quote. He continues to say, quote, This will require new strength and new rules for the United Nations, for disarmament without checks is but a shadow, and a, com uh, and a community without law is but a shell. Already, the United Nations has become both the measure and the vehicle of man's most generous impulses. Already, it is provoked, or provided, in the Middle East, in Asia, and Africa this year, in the Congo, a means of holding man's violence within bounds. But the great question which confronted this body in 1945 is still before us. Whether man's cherished hopes for progress and peace are to be destroyed by terror and disruption, whether the foul winds of war can be tamed in time to free the cooling winds of reason, and whether the pledges of our charter are to be fulfilled or defied. Pledges to secure peace, progress, human rights, and world law. End quote. Well, there's the first admittance that uh, JFK has taken a, quote, pledge to world law. Let's hear another, shall we? Kennedy continues, quote, Whatever advantages such a plan may hold out to my own country as one of the great powers, we reject it, for we prefer world law in the age of self-determination to world war in the age of mass extermination, end quote. Now step back for a moment to the meme being circulated by major alternative media pages on Facebook. Remember the four out of five presidents prefer world law and JFK's name when it was unchecked? His own words debunk that. Let's move forward. Later on in his speech, he says, quote, the weapons of war must be abolished before they abolish us. Now, I don't disagree with him at all on that point. I believe in the non-aggression principle, which is the ethical stance that initiatory force is always immoral. What I have a major issue with is that he is for world government, and throughout his speech, he praises the United Nations for their great work in upholding peace which is complete and utter nonsense. Although with the state, there will be nothing more than a monopoly on violence and unlimited corruption, but only so long we tolerate this most dangerous of superstitions. Hell, the United States has been at war for 222 out of its 200, 239 years of existence. If that's not telling, I don't know what is. Unless the concept of this state is totally abandoned, mankind will suffer forever. <laughs> 
Continuing, continuing on, he shows his trust and reliance on the United Nations. Quote, It would create machinery to keep the peace as it destroys the machinery of war. It would proceed through balanced and safeguarded stages designed to give no state military advantage over another. It would place the final responsibility for verification and control where it belongs. Not with the big powers alone, not with one's adversary or oneself, but an international organization within the framework of the United Nations. It would achieve under the eyes of an international disarmament organization, a steady reduction in force, both nuclear and conventional, until it has abolished all armies and all weapons except those needed for internal order and a new United Nations Peace Force. And it starts that process now, today, even as the talks begin. End quote. So you've read aspects of, of the bill that Kennedy signed. So you already at least had an idea that he was for world government. Now you've read his own words. These are his own admissions. Kennedy continues offering his support for PL 87-297. Quote, I therefore propose on the basis of this plan that disarmament negotiations resume promptly and continue without interruption until an entire program for general and complete disarmament has not only been agreed, but has actually been achieved. He continues, To destroy arms, however, is not enough. We must create even as we destroy, creating worldwide law and law enforcement as we outlaw worldwide war and weapons. In the world we seek, the United Nations Emergency Forces, forces, which have been hastily assembled, uncertainly supplied, and inad inadequately financed, will never be enough. The next part is, is one that should raise some eyebrows. Read carefully. Kennedy continues, quote, The new horizons of outer space must not be driven by the old, bitter concepts of imperialism and sovereign claims, end quote. Now, imperialism is a terrible thing, of course. United States attempt, uh, the United States attempt at imperialism is what has caused so much death, destruction, and turmoil all over the world. An utter and complete violation of its own federal constitution that requires a declaration of war from the U.S. Congress. What's wrong with sovereignty, though? Only someone that is for a world government would see sovereignty as bitter, as JFK implied. He continues... Quote, we shall propose further cooperative efforts between all nations in weather prediction and eventually in weather control. We shall propose finally a global system of communication satellites linking the whole world in telegraph and telephone and radio and television. End quote. That was quite the proposal. Does that mean that JFK is a conspiracy theorist? Uh, now, that's, that's enough out of the Global Disarmament Bill, uh, PL 87-297, and from JFK's speech. You should now understand JFK's admiration for the United Nations and strive for world government. It was in his own words. It's time to stop worshipping or even thinking that any one president had the people's best interests at heart. That is a ludicrous idea, and to think there was only one president that did is a naive thought. There are only two arguments I've really ever heard from people. One is that JFK was the only president that looked out for the people, or Ronald Reagan. The JFK one has been debunked, and Reagan's treason will be discussed in the second installment of this article, which will be titled, The Planned Police State. <clears throat> part 2. The Open Skies Treaty In Part 1, you saw some excerpts from PL 87-297, and from JFK's speech to the United Nations. This bill, and JFK's words, advocate for a world government to uphold world peace by the mechanism known as a United Nations Peace Force. In conjunction with the reduction of armaments, it began the process for military base closing, closings and a way to ensure that all nations are upholding their oath to at least begin the disarmament process. In this installment, we'll discuss the Open Skies Treaty, which is the way to ensure all nations are upholding their oath to disarmament, disarmament and to world peace. The Open Skies Treaty was first proposed by President Dwight Eisenhower in July 1955 to allow the United States and the Soviet Union to conduct aerial reconnaissance flights over each other's territory. Moscow rejected the proposal because they assumed it would be used for extensive spying. <clears throat> 
President George H.W. Bush revived the idea in 1989, and it was signed into being on March 24, 1992. The Open Skies Treaty permits each state party to conduct short-notice, unarmed reconnaissance flights over the other's entire territories to collect data on armaments, military forces, and military bases. This is consistent with what H.G. Wells advocated for in his nonfiction work, The New World Order, published in 1940. Quote, It is not unreasonable to anticipate the development of an ad hoc disarmament police, which will have its greatest strength in the air. How easily the spirit of an air police can be denationalized is shown by the instance of the air patrols on the United States-Canadian border, to which President Roosevelt drew my attention. An ad hoc disarmament police, with its main strength in the air, would necessarily fall into close cooperation with the various other world police activities. End quote. Among nations that signed are Canada, the United Kingdom, the Russian Federation, Spain, Turkey, Ukraine, and an additional 28 states parties. In 2008, the states parties celebrated the 500th overflight, and since then, the number of flights exceeds 800. Worth a mention is in 2009, the United States flew a total of 13 flights, 12 over Russia, and 1 over Ukraine. In addition to that, our sworn enemy, Russia, has conducted over 38 overflights in U.S. airspace as well. To be more specific, Russia flies over the U.S. four times a year. One of those mentioned by mainstream media took place from December 8th to 13th to the 13th, 2014. In, the, in this article, uh, U.S. Navy Commander Chris Nelson, who oversaw the flight, was quoted as saying, quote, Most of the world has no idea this treaty even exists. Whenever I mention that Russians fly uh, aircraft over the U.S. taking pictures, it blows people's minds, end quote. You certainly are correct, Mr. Nelson. The majority of folks don't even know this treaty exists. Hell, if you mention that Russian planes fly over the U.S., you may even be labeled as a conspiracy theorist. Now, how does this tie into the Global Disarmament Bill discussed in Part 1? Well, the answer is quite clear. The Open Skies Treaty is the inspection and verification aspect referenced in the Global Disarmament Bill. It is, quite simply, a way to ensure that the United States is disarming and that Russia is disarming, for example, in conjunction with the Global Disarmament Bill. It is also an instrument of trust by making all nation states feel more comfortable in disarming by knowing the other nation is as well. Another way to ensure disarmament is by war if a nation that didn't adopt the disarmament policy doesn't want to disarm. President George Bush, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, Secretary of State Colin Powell, and White House spokesman Ari Fleischer have all said that, quote, disarmament is the reason for going to war with Iraq, end quote. I wonder if Bush Jr.'s inaccurate assessment of the w WMDs in Iraq was substantiated by an Open Skies Treaty overflight, or if disarmament was only one of the excuses used. Your guess is as good as, good as mine, and I won't speculate. To conclude, John F. Kennedy wanted the entire world disarmed, except for the United Nations Peace Force and the minimal amount needed internally to provide support for the UN Peace Force. The Open Skies Treaty is the inspection and verification method used to ensure all nations are, in fact, disarming. The major question left is this. How do they plan to disarm Americans? The answer? Gun control and the warrantless surveillance police state apparatus. Uh, concomitant with an Internet of Things where all produced commodities will be tracked, traced, and scanned throughout the production cycle from raw material extraction to the retail shelf, the customer's home, and eventually the landfill. The final installment of this three-part article will be completed and posted soon. It will be posted in an article and audio form. Stay tuned. You've just heard JFK's complicity in establishing the American police state through disarmament, read by the author Shane Radliff, available at libertyunderattack.com.